This video is brought to you by Genshin Impact. I legit never thought this day would come. Yet, here we are, about to review Dragon Ball GT. While I have made Dragon Ball GT something of a running joke over the last while as a bit of lighthearted fun, there has always been an element of truth to it. When the original series ended way back when I was a kid, like many others my age, I quickly shifted to Dragon Ball GT thinking it would be more of what I loved about Dragon Ball Z. And at the time, it wasn't. I say at the time because right now I want to review this show as fairly as I possibly can. I haven't seen Dragon Ball GT in maybe 15 years, and I have changed considerably since then. The strong but negative feelings I had for Dragon Ball GT have, much like its relevance in the modern Dragon Ball and anime landscape, faded with time. And at present, I don't really recall much of the story, and my feelings towards it are about as neutral as they ever have been. So, what better time to dive headfirst into the show that ended it all for me when I was a young teenager? A show that pushed me away, frustrated me beyond belief, and admittedly moved me to tears. This is my review of the infamous and intensely controversial Dragon Ball GT. Part 1. The Black Star Dragon Balls. Dragon Ball GT isn't really divided into clean sections like Dragon Ball Super was, so I've decided to follow the arcs as they are defined in the fandom. The first arc being the Black Star Dragon Ball Saga that flows from episodes 1 through to 16. And I want to make something clear here from the get-go, having just finished watching these, it's not gonna be pretty, so if you're a fan of this arc, I'll try to be fair and explain where my issues are and why. So without further ado, Let's get into it. Dragon Ball GT! The story itself kicks off as Goku finishes up his training with Oob and then sends him on his way. I guess the ending of Dragon Ball Z wasn't worth following up on and Oob wasn't worth exploring right now. This honestly doesn't bother me too much, but really reinforces the notion that Goku's decision to go off for a decade training Oob was a bit of a waste of time. Or at least this is the message the show is sending us right now. A little bit later, the Pilaf gang make it to the lookout somehow and discover the Black Star Dragon Balls. You know, just sitting there. Out in the open. You know, the Dragon Balls that have earth-shattering ramifications if used? The dragon itself, when summoned, is probably the most visually impressive spectacle from this arc. However, Goku interrupts Pilaf, as he kinda sort of wishes Goku was a kid again? I mean, he sort of says it, but not really. I'm not really sure what counts as a wish anymore. But we gotta get the plot moving somehow, I guess. And it sure is a good thing that Goku's clothes became a kid with him too. Once Pilaf finishes using these balls to turn Goku into a little kid again, the balls then disperse throughout the universe. And that's when we hear the that the Earth will be destroyed in exactly one year from when the wish was made if the balls are not gathered again. Now this is where the show loses me even more. I have no earthly idea how these balls really work. I mean, I would assume like the other Dragon Balls, they would have turned to stone along with the other balls once the old guardian had passed. Also, why would their creator have made them to scatter across the universe? How would he, the creator of these Dragon Balls, have been able to gather them seeing as there was no other way to get off of Earth at the time? Also, I have no idea why there's a one year time limit and a consequence of not meeting that time limit too. It seems really arbitrary, only there to provide incentive for Goku, who up until this bombshell hit, was rather indifferent to being young again or to even collect the Dragon Balls again in the first place. I get that the Dragon Balls in this show are a MacGuffin used to make the story work, but they didn't need to be Dragon Balls in this instance. They're already different enough to warrant being their own thing. Tying them to objects within a show that has already so many rules to abide by makes things needlessly difficult to work. With that said, the rest of the episode is spent reintroducing old characters that we won't see for the rest of the arc, and most importantly, the character of Pan, someone we will be spending a lot of time with. Episode 2 is the first episode where we will see the pace the series will be moving at. Glacial pace. There's no sense of urgency and the decisions that are made seem excessively juvenile. Goku says that they should use the regular Earth's Dragon Balls to relocate themselves to the Dragon Balls in space, but I say, that's pretty dumb. Why not just wish them to Earth? Did I just make the entire arc pointless? The vast majority of this episode covers very filler-centric stuff like Goku getting kidnapped, Pan pouting over not being let go, and Trunks goofing off of work. Additionally, no one seems to be taking this thing with the balls seriously other than Gohan, Chi-Chi, and Bulma. In reality, the most capable people should go on this life-threatening trip, not the children as a form of discipline. Also, Vegeta has a mustache. I just needed to say that. 
Pan then sneaks out onto the ship before blasting off and is now part of the party. Goku, Trunks, and Pan blast off into space. At this point in my watch through, I really liked that Pan had a reason for leaving, to prove her maturity and independence, and in addition to this motivation has a strong personality. It's not exactly a unique character type or unique personality, but she fills the role well of an immature kid trying to be strong like her relatives. I'm gonna try to go through the episodes faster now because they get really bad. Episode three begins and they land on Imega and all of a sudden it feels like Star Wars. This subplot sees them ignoring the Dragon Balls that they literally just left to retrieve almost immediately after leaving Earth in order to deal with this planet that shakes people down for money. We then get introduced to Gil, a little robot that now acts as the group's dragon radar. <laughs> Episode four begins and yes, there is a part two to this story. And trust me, I've already glazed over a ton of stuff that really has no consequence within the story. Their ship gets confiscated and they need to retrieve it from this weird alien dictator guy. Goku can't use instant transmission because plot needs to happen and some random guy with big ears appears and knows that Goku is a Saiyan somehow based exclusively on his Kamehameha, an earth learned technique. And yes, now two episodes deep into this godforsaken subplot, they are still on this damn planet. And there's more! By the time the third episode in this mini arc comes around, I notice that an absurd amount of time has been spent not gathering the Dragon Balls. You know, the balls that if you don't gather them will bring about the Earth's destruction somehow? Rigiv, the big-eared alien guy that recognized Goku as a Saiyan, begins to fight Goku. It's a really short fight, but honestly, it's fine. It's definitely the best part of the show so far, but was only like two minutes long. I didn't really care about the fight, I don't care about Regiv, but it was better than looking at like 95% of what the show has put in front of me so far. My issue with this mini arc within this saga I'm watching can be summed up in one word. Pointless. The last three episodes could be removed entirely and the only thing that would be lost is the little robot guy. And he could have been introduced or incorporated into the story in a bunch of other ways. We didn't learn anything new about Pan or Trunks or Goku from this story's inclusion. Six episodes deep and we're finally close to the first Dragon Ball and it's the worst one so far. They land in this planet where everything is like Earth except giant. Pan gets taken by a bunch of bees for most of the episode and a giant accidentally takes the Dragon Ball and lodges it in its tooth. Pan gets rescued and Goku retrieves the ball by being the giant's dentist. None of this is important. The only thing you need to know is that they have one Dragon Ball now. Next. The next two episodes, yes two, are spent within a mini arc again. Fun. The story itself revolves around this village that are seemingly being tormented by this fat, ugly, annoying catfish monster. A monster that claims to cause earthquakes. In order to not anger the beast and to solve the problem, the gang decides that the best course of action is to dress Trunks like a girl and to offer him as a bride to the monster. It turns out that the beast cannot cause earthquakes but can only sense when they are going to happen. Which makes no sense considering the perfect timing the earthquakes have in the story shown up. But let's ignore that. They beat him up, they stop a volcano or something, and just as the Dragon Ball is about to be handed over, out of nowhere some blue guy in a red unitard steals the second Dragon Ball they spent two agonizingly slow episodes retrieving. I feel cheated. There is so much useless motion in this series, but however, I spoke too soon. What follows this is the main plot of the arc, and it's probably the worst anime anything I've ever seen. I'm going to try my best at describing what happens and why I have a problem with it. I cannot promise I won't get angry. They begin chasing after the unitards that stole the Dragon Ball until they get lost in a big worm boulder. Don't ask. Turns out a large group of bad guys are looking for the Dragon Balls across the universe, without any means of tracking them down no less. First of all, how did they know the Dragon Balls were out there now? They only became viable like last week. Additionally, if they did know about them, why not go to where they were created on Earth first before all this happened? Also, the odds of these Unitard guys coincidentally running into our gang as they found a Dragon Ball with the help of a Dragon Radar is astronomical. The person that was looking for the balls seems to be this witch doctor that uses a whip to turn people into dolls so that he can sacrifice them to this creature called loot. However, once the witch doctor receives the Dragon Ball from the Unitards, he scolds them for not getting the other Dragon Ball that the gang had. Hold up. How does this guy know where the Dragon Balls are now? If he knows where they are, then why were the bad guys searching around the universe for them blind? Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to touch on a wonderful little short animation for Genshin Impact. It's only about two or so minutes long, but it's a stunning look at one of the regions from the game. And I think regardless of how familiar you are with the series itself, it's a remarkably touching piece. 
It's always neat to see international collaborations in animation, and that's the case here with Hoyoverse teaming up with French studio Sun Creature to produce this. It's packed to the brim with the most stunning backgrounds that the camera lingers over while understated animation helps to bring things to life in a very naturalistic way. There's a real emphasis on the fine detail of the world, and it's all placed against a delicate piano piece that gives the animation a real serene feeling. It evokes that same sense of wonder you might get from watching a Studio Ghibli movie. More than anything, you just want to step inside the frame and explore. And I think that's pretty genius as you do have the option to simply play the game. If you want to take a look yourself, I've put a link in the description for you. I'm definitely curious to see if they'll tackle more regions in the future as I think this type of material works great as not only an advertisement, but a legitimate piece of art. It might sound like I'm skipping over a ton of stuff here. I'm sure a lot of you are saying, what? No, there must be more to this than just that. I'm sorry, there's really not. I'm doing my best to glaze over what isn't necessary and to focus on the main plot points as they stagger into my field of view here. For instance, do you want me to go in depth with this episode and explain how the unitards go back to the worm ball and control the gang with dancing for literally minutes and minutes of screen time? Oh, you touch my time. No, and neither do I, because this is the worst episode of Dragon Ball I've ever seen. The episode ends with Pan getting into trouble, shocking, accidentally trying to fly the Unitard spaceship to Lude's planet. Why? Because plot needs to happen. Episode 11, long story short, Pan gets captured slash turned into a doll, don't ask it's a long story, Gil finds the guys and they come to rescue her. A giant robot line is introduced and in seconds is destroyed by Goku. Where did it come from? Doesn't matter. The explosion itself wipes out the witch doctor guy holding the whip, but wait, the whip is alive and turns into a golden whip warrior thing. Episode 12, so we're introduced to the real boss now, I guess, and it's this weird alien guy with a soccer mom haircut fawning over doll Pan so delicately. Pretty convenient, isn't it, how he decided to hang on to Pan instead of throwing her into the pot like he did with the rest of the other worshippers? The weird alien with the soccer mom haircut begins undressing doll Pan and makes this face. I think this is the worst thing I've seen in a very long time. Now if you were to ask me, why is he doing all of this? Why does he want to resurrect Lude? I literally could not tell you. But loot is finally activated! Episode 13. A dumb looking pale green alien robot baby reveals itself and it's Lude in all of his glory. Why does it have a flabby chest with nipples? No idea. And it turns out the soccer mom haircut wearing alien otaku guy isn't the real boss either. This guy Dr. Mew is. I, I gotta say this now, there have been like 30 different boss reveals. First the person that stole the ball, then the leader of his group, then the witch doctor, then the whip, then the whip turned into a golden monster, then the weird doll otaku guy with the soccer mom haircut and now Dr. Mew. This is incomprehensibly bad. So it turns out Lude is being controlled by this Dr. Mew, someone that looks like an unlockable reskin of Dr. Jiro from Dragon Ball Fighters. In the end, the Unitards come back and start dancing again. No! The fight between Lude and the team of Goku and Trunks is boring, and ultimately Pan and the weird alien guy get absorbed by Lude. And believe it or not, I actually remember this part from when I was a kid. Pan and Goku need to coordinate their attack to the same area, one shot from the inside and one from the outside. And if my memory served me right, it's pretty dumb. Yep, and it sure is. The para para unitards who have all been absorbed by Lude too can conveniently communicate via telepathy to Goku on the outside. I hate this show. I, I really hate this show. Can I stop now? Eventually, they hit Lude right in the sweet spot at the exact same time to defeat him. While this was happening, Lude was just standing there, not defending himself, waiting to be attacked by Goku. It's at this point in the story I realize they've only retrieved two Dragon Balls and I feel a tremendous sadness descend upon me. The following two remaining episodes are essentially filler or setup for the later antics in the next arc. Episode 15 covers the guys landing on a desert planet with Pan getting into trouble being saved by Gil, which as it happens is my favorite episode from this arc. It's got nothing to do with the awful main plot, it's self-contained, it sets up the conflict between Pan and Gil early, and despite Pan treating Gil horribly, he still goes out to save her. Crazy to think that the most resonant, heroic moment from this series so far for me has been through a tiny plot device, MacGuffin Robot. Episode 16, on the other hand, the final episode in this arc, covers the gang landing on Gil's home planet as he seemingly betrays them. Goku and Trunks get captured for a change, and Pan is then left alone. And that concludes the Black Star Dragon Ball Saga. What a mess. 
of the 16 episodes that made up the story, I could easily see it streamlined down to 10 episodes if you remove the episodes with unrelated material. But even saying that, the main plotline seemed, to me at least, confused and ultimately it lacked direction. On June of 2005, producer Kozo Morishita had an interview where he discussed the production of Dragon Ball GT. In an effort to retain the golden time slot of 7pm every Wednesday, the brass behind Dragon Ball decided to create a new series in GT that would cover the exploits of the next generation in Pan and Trunks. This was part of the reasoning for changing Goku to a kid, to keep him in theme with the younger generation. Dragon Ball GT itself wanted to bring Dragon Ball back to its roots with an adventure-centric storyline, and they definitely did that here. However, Dragon Ball didn't just decide to go from lighthearted adventure centric storytelling to galactic wide battles with world ending stakes in literally one episode. Dragon Ball gradually over the course of a decade developed and advanced the story to naturally assume the stakes it did. GT currently as it stands already suffers from a lot of issues and growing pains were not something they needed on top of this laundry list of defects. And the production issues and lack of confidence in the product can be felt in this quote taken straight from that interview itself. Initially, we made about 26 episodes worth of rough plot outlines, but around when the final script for episode 3 was finished, we thought, these travel episodes aren't going to be interesting no matter how long we keep them going, are they? And so, we stopped. That's why Gil and the spaceship stopped appearing midways through. It's clear from just watching it that it had no idea of what it wanted to be. One second they're doing wacky adventures throughout space for kids, and another second they're doing big battles, followed by more tone-deaf slapstick with creepy undertones. It's all over the place and I'm really not a fan of it. The entire story is filled with scenarios where I can see the writer in various circumstances writing themselves out of a corner. Whether it be through Pan getting into specific kinds of trouble to influence the main cast, into dangerous situations, the bad guys randomly deciding not to do away with Pan as a doll, that catfish monster having earthquakes with perfect comedic timing, or the unitards knowing telepathy without which the situation would be entirely lost. Additionally, the writing is extremely formulaic and lazy. In that very same interview, Morishita said, Pan's role was to be strong but still lose to the enemies and then be rescued by Goku, a heroine who makes Goku a hero. Dragon Ball GT has an episode where Pan is turned into a doll, but that episode established the pattern of Pan sets the incident in motion while Goku resolves it. And that's Dragon Ball GT in a nutshell. Extremely contrived, formulaic, predictable, and demonstrably, unforgivably, relentlessly boring. Last week, our story ended as Gil seemingly betrayed Goku, Trunks, and Pan by leading them to his homeworld where he seems to be heralded as some sort of hero, as a key member among the ranks of General Rildo, a subordinate of Dr. Mew. As a nice change of pace, Goku and Trunks get kidnapped per Gil's instructions, leaving Pan alone to figure out some sort of plan to fix this horrible situation. Honestly, it's not a terrible cliffhanger, and now that we're all caught up, let's go! Alrighty, so this entire 23... <sighs> Long group of episodes I'll be watching can be split into two separate stories. The first acting as a sort of setup to the narrative that follows. But that's not to say that this first half can't stand on its own and isn't entertaining in its own right. That's right. If you thought I was here just to rag on GT, then I've got news for you. I actually like this part. I am not going to, nor have I ever pretended to like or dislike something simply because it's a popular opinion. I just share my own opinions as I have them. Win, lose, or draw. But on this occasion, I actually really like this part. Now, that's not to say I think it's perfect and I most definitely have my issues with it, but compared to the first arc, it's like Ultra Instinct William Shakespeare. Right off the bat, the story establishes who the point of view character will be, what the goal is, and what Pan needs to do. This is advantageous because, now that all of that is understood by the viewer, you're now free to have fun finding wacky ways for Pan to infiltrate the compound that holds her grandpa in trunks. And those antics are very fun, sneaking around little bits of action here and there with plenty of characters shining through. This is GT honestly at its best for me, and it was nice seeing Pan earn a win for a change too. She eventually finds her way into the main chamber the others are being held, also finding trouble for herself. However, in doing so, inspires Goku to free himself. The next episode doesn't really offer much. It's essentially a fighting heavy episode following Goku as he dismantles the forces of General Rildo. Despite not much happening narratively, it's clear that this episode and arc is following a very different story philosophy than the original 16 that I reviewed in part one. The next episode is where things really start to kick off, however, with some beautiful artwork capturing Goku's first altercation with 
General Rildo, and Pan's attempt to reclaim Trunks, whom at this time looks as though he's been frozen in carbonite. Lots of Star Wars influence in this arc, and now that I think about it, Pan even got stuck in a trash compactor in the earlier episode. Speaking of which, I should also mention while in that trash compactor, she met a friendly pink alien robot. This will be important later. The fight itself between General Rildo and Goku is actually quite good. Lots of imaginative choreography and angles are implemented. Things, however, at this time don't look great for Trunks, who has been just transported to Dr. Mew's laboratory. As the story continues, Goku continues his battle with General Rildo, eventually gaining the upper hand before Rildo reveals that he is the actual planet they are on. Very reminiscent of the Dragon Ball Z movie, The Return of Cooler. While this is all happening, Pan continues in her attempts at infiltrating the compound to rescue Trunks, but without a means of teleportation to Dr. Mew, Pan is fighting a losing battle. However, she manages to run into her friend from the trash compactor she helped escape, who offers to help her in this endeavor. With some difficulty, they manage to barge into the complex, but are quickly surrounded once again. However, not one to go quietly, Pan begins charging her Kamehameha, aiming it right at Gil and an army of robots. At the last Last second, Gil teleports her back to the front door once again, only this time with the Dragon Balls. We quickly switch back to the fight between General Rildo and Goku as it rages on in various interesting locations until Pan rushes into the battle showing Goku that she has the Dragon Balls. Rildo uses this distraction as an opportunity to turn both Pan and Goku into Carbonite, teleporting them both to Dr. Mew also. Up until now, Gil has been helping the forces of Dr. Mew and General Rildo in their efforts to capture the Saiyans and obtain the Dragon Balls. However, suddenly, Gil unfreezes Pan and Goku, revealing his traitorous actions in the past had been a ruse in order to get the guys closer to Dr. Mew. Trunks reveals himself to be in perfect health and to have been in on it the entire time, orchestrating this plan along with Gil in order to tamper with and destroy whatever Dr. Mew was working on. I'm not sure if I'm a fan personally of this swerve the story attempted to pull off. While it was indeed surprising, it's not surprising because it cleverly concealed the true nature of Trunks and Gil by means of well-structured writing. No, it did so by not giving any clues at all. Aside from Gil giving Pan the Dragon Balls an episode prior, Surprises like this work best when it makes the audience say to themselves, oh, of course, it all makes sense now, even going back to the first episode of this season. This didn't do that for me. It's just a reveal of another piece of information I couldn't have predicted based on what the story demonstrated so far to me. That said, I don't dislike it really, it's just not what I was hoping for. After this grand reveal, Trunks leads the gang into this excessive, unnecessarily massive chamber housing an engineered parasite known as Baby. While he floats there like a good boy, Trunks reveals that he took the initiative while everyone was distracted to disarm the situation by halting Baby's development and life by way of computer virus. This, however, does not stop Dr. Mew from going full psycho trying to revive the artificial creation. While seeming futile, his efforts do bear fruit. Baby lives, exploding forth from his tank, but is quickly taken out by Goku, Pan, and Trunks. It looks over, but Baby is not done. As the gang tries to escape the planet, Baby attempts to stop them through General Rildo body. The episode ends with Baby revealing that he designed Dr. Mew. Which, to me, honestly sounds like it makes as much sense as performing brain surgery on yourself. This isn't the last time we see Baby, though. Following this, there's a collection of two episodes following the gang as they stumble across a spaceship wreckage holding within it a Dragon Ball. However, after arriving, Gil senses a life form on board, an unconscious young child. They quickly transport the child to a planet for aid where it's revealed that he and the rest of the ship he came from had been eliminated by Baby. Now dwelling within the young child, he attempts to take over Trunks' body, but ultimately fails in doing so because he lacked the strength. It's at this point I thought the story was going to go downhill, but it actually takes a major upswing. We hard cut to Earth and we are reintroduced to Goten and his family. I love Goten's new all about the ladies and date character. He still holds a pleasant personality, but with that quirk it adds some comedy and edge to him that I really enjoy. While out on a date, he encounters a number of individuals who have come under Baby's influence. He's made it to Earth while the gang were out gathering the remaining Dragon Balls. The fight between Baby and Goten is honestly interesting with Goten showcasing some of his fantastic new personality. However, he ultimately falls as Baby infiltrates his body. Body. At this point, Baby's ultimate goal is to possess Vegeta's body, the strongest fighter on Earth. So he works his way up the pecking order, securing Gohan's body also in this episode. Once Baby takes a hold of Gohan, he makes a beeline for Vegeta, who at this time is on his way back from the store with his daughter Bra. A wonderful side effect of Baby's
Ruby's character that hasn't been seen before is that it forces interesting matchups we wouldn't expect to see normally. An interesting rematch too between Vegeta and Gohan who haven't fought really since he was a kid. Within this episode, it's revealed that Baby can influence the minds of those he was once within. It's also explained that he's a tougher creation and Vegeta recognizes him. The fight between the two is honestly quite fun with nice animation in places. Additionally, the scene works very naturally for exposition too, which is always a plus. Baby is an engineered Tuffle parasite with the former Tuffle ruler's DNA embedded within him. He can lay eggs in his former host to maintain control over them, and his goal is to take revenge on the Saiyan race that destroyed and stole his homeworld. And to rule the universe, because of course it is. While all this horribleness is happening on Earth, we switch back to the gang in space as they finally retrieve the last of the Dragon Balls. Once they arrive back home, it's revealed to us, but not Goku, Pan, and Trunks, that the Earth has been totally overrun by Baby and his minions. Before the gang goes their separate ways to their respective homes, they give the Dragon Balls to a possessed Dende, and Pan says her goodbyes to Gil by tying her bandana around the small robot. While this is all happening, as a quick aside, Satan had the ingenious idea of hiding inside Majin Buu. I absolutely love that. Majin Buu is immune and it makes complete sense. Very clever. Once Goku and Pan arrive home, they are ambushed by Baby's minions. But Trunks' ambush specifically had much more of an emotional weight behind it, I think. As Vegeta lures Trunks into the house, Gil's sensors are going off. Danger, danger, he says. As Baby Vegeta reveals his true intent, Gil beats him and Trunks to the punch with some missiles, catching Baby off guard, protecting Trunks. As Baby begins talking trash, insulting and threatening the small robot to stand down, Gil without hesitation reloads his missiles. Compared to pretty much everyone in this series, Gil is outmatched and he knows that. That's what makes this scene so powerful for me. And I actually got emotional when Baby took him out in the end. And it's not over. That great scene is immediately followed by the single best reveal of the arc. And this arc has a few great reveals still to come. Baby, it turns out, had control over Trunks this entire time. He didn't activate him until he brought the balls back, which is incredibly smart of him, Baby, and an exceptionally well-delivered swerve by the writers. It makes complete sense from both mechanical and motivational points of view. We then switch back to Goku's situation as the fight rages on between himself and Gohan when out of nowhere, Goten tries to blindside him. This, however, is not a problem for Goku as he blocks the blast without even looking. Goku is much more serious in this arc, which I'm honestly really happy about. Satan uses this lull in the action to fill Goku in on what's happened. Every character is now up to speed and the pieces are in place. Here's hoping they can stick the landing. What follows is Goku's first encounter with Baby Vegeta. And bad news, he can't maintain Super Saiyan 3 because of his infant body. Baby, on the other hand, can absorb his servant's power, draining the energy from Goten, Gohan, and Trunks. I sincerely thought Baby Vegeta's design looked much more intimidating before this power absorption however. This is the start of a trend unfortunately. As Baby gets stronger, his appearance goes from looking like an intimidating infected version of Vegeta to something that's far less interesting in terms of design and are overly complex and definitely something that takes away from the action for me. With that said, Baby easily defeats Goku. Meanwhile, Pan and Mr. Satan are safe for now thanks to Boo's powers. Baby then retires to his throne where he uses the Dragon Balls to wish for his home planet to be recreated. This is where some weird stuff starts to happen, but honestly, I'm sort of into it. Goku finds himself sort of stuck in another dimension. I was worried it was a complete deus ex machina, but it turns out that the Supreme Kai made a save on Goku at the last possible second before he was defeated by Baby. It's actually quite a clever idea using the Kai's instantaneous movement. During this, Goku ends up falling into another dimension, with his only means of escape being a decisive defeat of this character in a dangerous board game. It's silly, but I enjoy it for the same reasons I enjoy Snake Way's antics. Goku has difficulty initially, but finds out that that's because the other guy is an absolute cheat. Once this character's cheating is exposed, the game itself begins to fall apart and Goku manages to escape the dimension, randomly appearing in a random part of the universe. Once the Supreme Kai senses his energy, he plucks Goku and the folks he rescued from the random part of space back to safety. I really like this, and to be honest, I've really enjoyed how the story has been structured so far. It's paced well, Baby has an interesting power with a perfect motivation, the stakes feel massive, and most importantly, they are doing a great job at delivering surprises without breaking the established rules and logic of the Dragon Ball world. It's honestly very impressive. After this, Goku begins his training on the world of the Kais. While this is all happening, Pan, her grandpa, and Boo devise a plan. But in order to enact this scheme that involves laxatives, they make their way to Baby's new planet in order to get close to him and find more trouble than they bargained for. They are all attacked, and right as Pan was about to be choked out by her father, Oob 
makes the save. Awesome. <laughs> This arc is so crazy. Oob fights Baby, but quickly loses. However, during this, Boo feels a connection to Oob. He brings Satan and Pan to safety and says his goodbyes, rushing in to make the save on Oob, reuniting with him. Honestly, a really nice full circle moment for Majin Buu, and much better than what he got in Dragon Ball Super. Baby resumes his fight against Oob. While this is happening, the Kaias are in the middle of trying to regrow Goku's tail. The contrast of this epic Oob versus Baby fight with Goku having pliers on his butt is hilarious. Oob makes a misstep, however, turning himself into chocolate instead of Baby. Goku, now with his tail regrown, rejoins the action to fight Baby. He goes Super Saiyan 3 from the start, but is quickly defeated. Lying on a heap, he begins staring at Earth, recalling his life there. Suddenly, Goku begins transforming into a golden Ozaru. I have an issue with this. Earth acting as a substitute for the moon is weird, and I really don't like it. Naturally, Goku has no control as the Ozaru, but Pan helps Goku regain control by showing him a picture of when she was little with him. It's pretty touching. Immediately, he begins transforming into Super Saiyan 4. I don't think I need to say this, but it's an awesome design, and it's tailor-made for the baby saga. <laughs> It's not looking good for the parasite, but in a matter of seconds, a baby mind controlled Bulma pulls a machine out of her butt that harnesses the Earth's blood waves and fires it at baby, who has no tail. This is a real bad case of wanting the fight to be a certain specific way, but not having the first clue of how to get it there without breaking a number of rules. Which is a shame because it was so consistent before this. Baby begins to transform into a golden Gozaru. On the bright side, they have a built in excuse for baby to be able to control this form. Vegeta knows how to and so therefore baby can take advantage of that. There's also a nice shot where Goku stands literally between the earth and its destruction as baby fires a super gallic gun. Goku manages to block the massive blast however baby has lost his senses, becoming what he hates the most, an out of control monster. Both Baby and Goku lie motionless, completely zapped of their energy. While this is all happening, the Kais devise a plan to use the sacred water from the Garlic Jr. arc of Z of all things to free those under Baby's control. It's a cute idea and I actually kind of like it. Using this water, Trunks is freed from Baby's control and is tasked with finishing off Baby. However, Bulma, still under Baby's control, fires more bullshit, I mean blutz waves at Baby. This for some reason fully energizes him and Goku staggers to his feet once again. While Goku is on the brink and with Pan in danger, Trunks sends a blast knocking over Baby. Gohan, Goten and the others also come to Goku's rescue having been freed from Baby's control thanks to the sacred water. Goku requests that everyone give him their power but Baby doesn't give him enough time. Suddenly something begins happening to Baby. It's Oob and he's alive inside of him. Apparently he changed the chocolate on purpose to get the jump on Baby from the inside. Goku uses this time to absorb the other's energy to replenish his own, they continue to fight with Baby for an episode, and Goku blasts off his tail. But I thought he didn't need the tail with the blood waves. As Vegeta's body reverts to normal size, Baby for some reason remains gigantic within him. Despite him being malleable for the entire arc, this is honestly a terrible way to keep Vegeta alive while removing Baby from his body. Also, I guess Baby didn't lay eggs inside Vegeta either? As a last ditch effort, Baby tries to escape in a spaceship, but Goku stops him by blasting him into the sun. They then return the Earth to normal by spreading the sacred water. But since the Dragon Balls were not brought back in time, the Earth explodes along with Piccolo who decided to stay behind on Earth as it exploded. He did this in order to to get rid of the Dragon Balls because he believes that they cause more harm than good. And just like that, Piccolo and the Earth are gone. The story ends as they use the Namekian Dragon Balls to restore the Earth and everything back to normal. This was much, much, much more enjoyable than the first arc. In fact, that's an understatement. From the very beginning, it was obvious that there was a much clearer vision and goal for this story. And because it focused more on action with sprinkles of adventure, it felt like a much more natural continuation on from Dragon Ball Z. I also really liked the idea of Baby being a parasite, using his foe to help him mature and take control. I also enjoyed his origin and motivation, watching him slowly slip and turn into exactly what he hated most of all, foreign invader mindlessly destroying other planets and even his own in the name of his race. There were also plenty of wonderful character moments too, through Gil, Pan, Majin Buu, and even Goten. I also really liked that Super Saiyan 4 allowed Goku to be an adult. One of my biggest gripes with Goku getting turned into a kid was how his character models stunted and negatively impacted all the fights he took part in. Akira Toriyama changed Goku into an adult so that he could make use of his longer limbs as Dragon Ball focused more and more on fighting. Stumpy limbs don't offer much in the way of interesting posing, despite making his kid self in GT skinnier than the original appearance was. Now that Super Saiyan 4 exists, 
exists within the story, Goku can enjoy the best of both worlds, doing all the lighthearted stuff a kid would, but when he gets serious, it's adult time. And finally, the story managed to pull off some wonderfully written surprises too. Whether it being through Trunks' body being under the control of Baby the entire time, Boo housing Pan and Mr. Satan safely, or Oob making the save on more than one occasion. With all of that said, I think this arc still had some major problems. The swerve of Trunks and Gil being in cahoots at the beginning of the arc doesn't really land like I would have liked. Additionally, General Rill though isn't defeated, he just sort of becomes irrelevant. Also, I didn't like the Earth being used as a Blutzwave source and Bulma creating a Blutzwave amplifier in minutes was utterly ridiculous. That was honestly probably the arc's biggest blemish for me seeing as the plot hinges on that mechanic for Baby and Super Saiyan 4. And finally... The fight should have ended one episode sooner. It should have ended right after Oob revealed himself to be inside Baby. That was a great swerve and the height of the fight's action for me. The following episode just shows more useless one-sided fighting on the side of Goku and honestly really ruins the fight's memory and atmosphere in the end. However, with that said, despite these drawbacks, I think the baby arc of Dragon Ball GT was very, very fun and in a lot of places, well thought out. I can't wait to see what the next arc has in store. Episode 1 begins and there's a world championship! I'm excited! I always love a good Dragon Ball tournament, but this is actually filler and has nothing to do with the story that follows, so I'll glaze over it as quickly as I can. Goku is fighting in the kids division because Mr. Satan is feeling depressed after what happened to Boo in the last arc, and so he wishes for Pan to take his place by winning the tournament. But I spoke too soon! As Mr. Satan is being given a massage, one of the tournament officials explains that the four finalists have been determined and Pan has elected to withdraw from the competition as she has no interest in being the successor to Mr. Satan. We switch over to Goku as the children's division finals get underway. He's facing some unassuming kid called Magyur. Magure. I don't know. However, before he gets a chance to begin, Vegeta barges in like a WWE wrestler demanding a fight with Goku. While Goku is distracted, Magyur pushes Goku out and wins. Thrilling stuff. Following that epic display, the Adult Division's championship match begins. Epichiri versus Papaya Man. The fight begins and Oob, I mean Papaya Man, gives Epichiri a German suplex, after which he immediately gives up. Papaya Man is the victor and Goku tells him to remove his mask. It's Oob! <gasps> because Pan had pulled out, Mr. Satan now has to face off against Oob, who takes the fight pretty seriously and starts thrashing on Mr. Satan. Right as he's about to deal the finishing blow to Mr. Satan, Boo stops Oob right in his tracks. I kinda love that. It totally caught me off guard and Oob leaves himself wide open for Mr. Satan to land one punch knocking him out of bounds. Satan gets emotional believing that he won using his own abilities against Oob. That's a really sweet parting gift Majin Buu left for his grieving friend. This win gives Mr. Satan new life and vigor, encouraging him to remain the world's champion. All in all, this episode was pretty cute. Nice self-contained story that wraps everything up in a wholesome bow at the end. But now it's time for the main entree. Episode 2. Dr. Mew is still alive! I have several questions. Wait, no, he finds himself walking aimlessly in hell when he runs into Dr. Jiro. They decide to join forces in their efforts to bring an end to Son Goku. I have no idea how they're going to achieve this from hell, but I'm sure we're going to find out. Hard cut to Goku's house as his friends and family are having a get together over dinner. A knock on the door reveals an injured trunks on the verge of collapse. Before fainting, he utters, Android 17. Investigating the situation, they notice a massive hole in the clouds outside. As they observe this, King Kai begins ringing in Goku's ear, informing him that, for some reason, the living world and other world have become stuck together. We later learn that this is due to an Android 17 in Hell linking with Android 17 in the living world. From the outset, it looks as though Android 17 in the living world is being controlled in some capacity, either by the other Android or Jiro in Hell. That much is honestly still not understood, and I hope you don't miss King Kai because that's literally the last time we see him in this arc. Once this is all explained, Seventeen challenges Goku to come to hell alone, because that would be the smart thing to do, in order to fight the people he sent there. Now, this arc frames it such that Goku is responsible for all the villains being placed in hell. What follows is the release from hell and pouring out onto Earth of all the villains. A news broadcast proceeds to show images of escaping villains, the vast majority of which Vegeta ended the lives of and not Goku. And just as a quick aside, when it comes to even major villains like Frieza and Cell, he might have defeated Frieza, but Future Trunks sent him to Otherworld, and Cell was defeated by Gohan. Regardless of all of this, Goku accepts the challenge, blindly charging 
digging into the void alone. And while this is all happening, the forces of Earth defend it from the villains that have been released. Naturally, when Goku goes up to hell to confront 17, Dr. Jiro and Dr. Mew, they give him the slip and proceed to Earth without him trapping Goku in hell. Who could have seen that coming? But that's not all. The episode comes to a close and it's revealed that Frieza and Cell remained in hell to face off against Goku. Episode 3 kicks off as Goku begins going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Frieza and Cell, not being intimidated in the slightest, and exploding while powering up? It's not really a fight or even taken seriously by Goku, who literally surfs on a Kienzan thrown by Frieza. Needless to say, in a quick and embarrassing fashion, Goku begins dismantling the two warriors. However, one small hiccup. They are immortal in hell? I'll address that later. Smash cut again to Earth as we see Vegeta confronted by Nappa. This, I thought, was a perfect time for some dialogue between the two Saiyans, giving Vegeta a chance to express all the changes he has undergone since their last parting. But nope, he's gone in literally an instant. But fret not, 17 is here to take his place instead. We then cut back to the fight in Hell as Cell successfully absorbs Goku. But Goku somehow crawls back out? Since that wasn't successful, Frieza and Cell, using a new technique, send him to Hell's basement, or something. A place beneath the current hell they dwell within underneath the clouds. At this point, I honestly have no idea what's going on. Once in this strange place, Goku becomes part of a stew prepared by this old woman. But that's not all, unfortunately. In this strange place, she places Goku in a number of strange and uncomfortable scenarios. I don't know what her goal is here exactly, and her preventing him from moving I don't even know is necessary. Can Goku even get out of here? Is it possible to do so under his own power? I have honestly no idea. Because of this lack of information, the tension that I assume they are trying to achieve doesn't exist or have the chance to exist, as I have no idea what the parameters of this realm even are. What's possible here? We cut to Earth as Android 17 encounters Android 18, managing to put her under some sort of mind control. My assumption is the same mind control 17 is currently under himself. The fourth episode kicks off in a major way. Krillin attempts to reach 18 and 17 as all of this is going on, expressing his confusion as to why 17 is working for Jiro, thinking that he once resented him. Why is he working for him, he expresses. It seems to work for a moment, but quickly 17 snaps back under this evil influence, firing a blast straight through Krillin, leaving his body lifeless in the arms of his wife, Android 18. And man, does she lose it, absolutely savaging and brutalizing her brother for what he's done, screaming to give Krillin back. It's honestly really powerful raw stuff and one of, if not the most powerful scenes I've ever seen from Android 18 since her introduction to the show. 17, however, is much more powerful than her, unfortunately, easily leaving her in a heap next to her husband before making his way to his doppelganger. Back in hell, Frieza and Cell discover Goku after being frozen in ice by the old woman. Taking advantage of this, they charge their final blast to destroy the Saiyan. However, in the nick of time, Goku manages to break free from the ice. The ice can only keep those who are already dead frozen, apparently. And so he turns the tables on them using that very same ice trap. We switch back to Earth as the Android 17 from Hell is evenly matched against Vegeta, who for some reason doesn't go Super Saiyan. But not for long. The other 17 arrives and quickly begins to change things. They fuse. I don't like this idea personally. This story didn't really convince or sell me on this concept successfully, and I'm really not a fan of the design personally, but let's see how things pan out. They all begin rushing Super Android 17 because that's the smart thing to do in this situation, resulting in pretty much how you imagine it going down. Everyone getting decked. And while this is all happening, Goku is trying to figure out a way to get out of hell. Apparently Yemma can't do it as something outside of his control or our knowledge is preventing him. As this is said, it shows the Dragon Balls cracking. I have no idea what this means yet. Piccolo during this interrupts this line of thought, somehow, requesting to be placed in hell. So Yemma can put Piccolo in hell, but not take Goku out? seems convenient. Anyways, Piccolo has a plan. Episode 5. Okay, so Piccolo's plan is to connect the Earth with Otherworld the same way the two 17s did at the beginning, using his connection with Dende. Okay, first of all, he can communicate with Dende beyond the grave. Okay, fine, I mean, I thought you needed someone like King Kai to do that, but whatever. What I want to know is, why did Piccolo need to be brought to hell in the first place? Couldn't he have communicated this to Goku and told him to make a connection with him and one of his sons earlier? Surely they are more similar than Piccolo and Dende are, and Piccolo ends up not even being able to do it until Goku helps him anyway. Whatever. Once the gateway is open, Goku uses this as an opportunity to leave and join the battle on Earth against Super Android 17. However, before he arrives, Vegeta is on the verge of being sent to Otherworld himself. That is, until Pan takes things into her own hands, holding Dr. Jiro hostage 
hostage with Gil, the real MVP. She demands that Super Android 17 stop in his tracks, and he does. He stops aiming at Vegeta and switches to Dr. Jiro and Pan. This swerve is insanely bad. Dr. Mew begins laughing, facing the other doctor, practically twirling his mustache, explaining that while they were developing the android, in other world, off screen, might I add, he enhanced him such that he would only listen to his commands. And needless to say, this results in Jiro's demise. Vegeta quickly regains his footing and begins blustering about how he doesn't need Kakarot, how he's the real number one, etc. Only two seconds later, be saved by Kakarot, bringing the episode to a close. We are now entering the final two episodes, and so begins the battle between Super Android 17 and Goku. Goku punches the android once and sends him literally to the other side of the planet. Android 17 proceeds to express how Goku is letting him down very cliche. At this point, I'm just waiting for Super Saiyan 4. Yet, Goku persists in only using the regular Super Saiyan form. Also, as another quick aside, the sheer number of times Android 17 in this arc has pushed back his hair in the exact same way is more than the number of scenes Piccolo has had in this entire series so far. Just saying. Anyways, Goku gets right up into his face and fires a point-blank Kamehameha to zero effect. And so, finally, Super Saiyan 4 comes out and we can start taking things seriously. We then smash cut to possibly the last thing I expected. A short scene with Chi Chi, Bulma, Videl, and Bra as they make plans to join the action too. I have no idea what's happening anymore. Anyways, the android is absorbing Goku's blast, and so naturally, because this is how the fight is written, Goku begins firing an enormous and unreasonable number of random key blasts that are completely out of character for him. Also, Super Android 17 has this ability to absorb energy, despite both Android 17 specifically not having that ability at all. And even if I were to ignore that, the fight is so boring. Because because the android can absorb his key attacks, when Goku learns this, he acts as if his hands are tied. Goku is not just a key attack guy. The entire fight with Frieza on Namek, while it did have key attacks incorporated, the vast majority was martial arts hand-to-hand -hand close quarters combat. And another thing, to confirm that the android was absorbing the attacks, Goku fires his strongest blast at him. So one of two things would happen in this instance. Either his assumption that he does in fact absorb his energy would be proven correct and he does absorb that energy. or or he'd blow up the earth because he's aiming downwards! Episode 7. The final episode kicks things off as the girls are making their way to the action for some reason. Goku manages to dodge the android's big attack and teleports behind him using all of his limbs to restrain him. In this moment, Goku begins to gather power and releases a giant burst of energy. As the dust clears, Goku is in his infant base form once again and the android is still alive. Apparently he raised his barrier or something. Super Android 17 begins charging the same blast he did earlier to finish off Goku. When out of nowhere, Android 18 appears on the battlefield. She begins reprimanding him for sending Krillin to Otherworld and Goku hears this news. She apparently survived the last attack at the hands of her brother because he was purposely avoiding her vital area that once housed a bomb placed there by the late Dr. Jiro. However, it has, unbeknownst to Android 17, been removed by the dragon, and so Android 18 begins to bluff. While this is all going on, Dr. Mew begins calling 17 pathetic and a coward for not firing on Goku and 18 anyway, resulting in, you guessed it, Dr. Mew being blown up instead at the hands of 17. 18 uses this moment of distraction as an opportunity to unload a bombardment of key attacks on the super android, resulting in him absorbing all of the energy she releases. Goku notices that when he absorbs the energy, he needs to have his body in a particular pose. What a strange design choice. Leaving himself wide open for attack, and Goku does just that. Flying right through him with a dragon fist and landing consecutive Kamehamehas, finishing the fight. Not a fan. <laughs> The episode wraps up as they conclude that Seventeen must have known about the bomb and still missed intentionally because she was his sister. The girls arrive but are too late and they take care of any and all loose ends with the Dragon Balls. Oh boy. Where do I begin? Okay, Dragon Ball GT's first arc was mindless adventure. Baby's arc was fighting mixed with adventure, each facet fighting an adventure serving a purpose in telling the story of the baby arc. In this Super Android 17 arc, it's the opposite of the first. Instead of mindless adventure, it's just mindless fighting. The arc is almost exclusively fighting and the fights have no weight behind them. All of these villains have been defeated, get no dialogue and are simply there to facilitate numbers to prevent and give trouble to Earth's forces which we barely see. Additionally, where the last arc with Baby succeeded, the arc being just about him, this arc is not really about Android 17, consistently shifting focus from him to various other villains that ultimately have little or nothing to do with the main story and its climax. In other words, it doesn't build up to anything. At its core, this is a revenge story, 
sort of. The two doctors getting their revenge on Goku. Yet the two doctors are eliminated by Seventeen who has no known motivation to us in the story. What does he want? If he wants what Dr. Mew wants, then why did he remove him entirely? I really didn't like this aspect of the story and it only further emphasized that the people in charge of this only wanted to create excuses for them to fight and had nothing to say. Well, little to nothing to say. The scenes including Android 18 and Krillin were honestly very touching and hit all the right notes for me personally. The arc was at its best when she and her husband were on screen. Amazing I think how they played such a small role while being so important to the story. It's a bit of a waste in all honesty. Speaking of waste, the stuff that happens to Goku and Hell isn't compelling. It's all rather silly and takes up too much time within this already very short story. It keeps introducing new aspects of the Hell landscape that weren't privy to us prior Therefore, they don't act as surprises, just conveniences to keep Goku locked down in there. Like Yemen not being able to pull him out of there, or there being a basement to hell at all, or Goku being able to melt just because he's alive. Stuff like that. And all of these new reveals don't really add anything to the story, they just facilitate ways to delay it, for Goku to proceed and for Cell and Frieza to finally meet their defeat in hell. Speaking of Frieza and Cell, why is it that they are immortal in hell? This makes no sense to me. During the end of Dragon Ball Z, in the final fight against Kid Buu, wasn't it stated to Vegeta that if he loses here while in the afterlife he won't be able to come back? That he'll stop existing or something? Additionally, the entire arc hinges on this brainwashing of the androids angle and yet it's never explained how this is even possible. Or even how Dr. Jiro and Dr. Mew found the supplies or parts necessary to create Android 17 in hell. It's just glazed over as if it's some unimportant detail, yet the entire story is built upon it. My final criticism for this arc is that the fights were on honestly really boring. Perhaps this was because they had no emotional weight for me, but I genuinely wasn't impressed by the action even on a surface level. Everything looks standard and bleh. And those are my thoughts on Dragon Ball GT's Super Android 17 Saga. Bleh. A saga that felt about as good as a rush book report and felt slower and more monotonous than the vast majority of sagas despite it only really being six episodes long if you don't include the filler episode at the beginning. Currently GT is batting one for three so far, so not exactly a fantastic record. Okay, so to provide some catch up and context, in the last episode, Goku managed to defeat Super Android 17 and in an attempt to return the Earth back to normal, gather the Dragon Balls to make a wish. However, something isn't quite right. All the way through the last arc or so, the Dragon Balls have been seen with cracks appearing and chippings covering their once flawless exterior. And when finally gathered during the final episode of the last arc, something unusual begins to emerge from the balls. Some evil key and a sinister looking dragon. Again, not a bad setup at all. The the premise is interesting, and it links the prior arc with this one very, very well. Bringing us to Episode 1. The episode opens and Shenron is looking a little worse for wear. He announces that he won't be the lapdog to anyone anymore, and King Kai begins explaining that the Dragon Balls have become tainted by negative energy from overuse. At this point, I'm sure King Kai is only being used for exposition and literally nothing more. Shenron then absorbs the Dragon Balls and flies off in different directions as seven separate dragons. Because the Dragon Balls have been overused, those monsters were born and released from within them. By developing the Dragon Radar and using the balls flippantly over the last 30 years, they have abused their powers and created created disorder within nature. Now the Earth and the universe are in peril, and that's pretty much the gist of things this story is going for. Goku assumes responsibility and journeys to fix the issue. In his commute to doing so, disasters begin occurring all over the world. Volcanoes, avalanches, lightning storms, twisters, cities being destroyed, that sort of thing. Each disaster having its own dragon behind it. And as Goku is searching for the dragons, he realizes that he has no idea where he's going. And that's when Pan appears from behind him with Gil, a functional dragon radar. Although Though I am less than happy with the tenuous reason Pan is being allowed to tag along, together they happen upon a small area covered in what looks like sludge. Gil begins alerting them that a dragon is nearby, and that's when they have their very first encounter. The setup for this has honestly been great, with plenty of tension building up to this reveal, and episode two. So it turns out that this dragon is super weak and Pan begins to take this as an opportunity to show Goku what she's really made of, dismantling the toad-like dragon with relative ease. This dragon totally took the wind out of my sails and the tension out of this entire arc for me. And here's a small spoiler, it doesn't get much better than this for a while. This, to me at least, wasn't the dragon to start off this search with, but 
whatever. As the fight continues, he gains more and more strength, eventually overpowering Pan. It turns out that there's something up with this dragon. Apparently, he emits negative energy, causing whomever is nearby to have its energy sucked from it. And so, while he isn't getting any stronger, Pan and Goku are most certainly getting weaker and weaker the more they hang around him. Additionally, according to this dragon, he was born from a specific wish made to return Upa's father to life. Meaning each dragon was created by a specific wish from the past, which is honestly a really nice touch, I think. Once he finishes explaining this, the two of them are drained of energy and he hits them with a blast and dumps them into a poisonous lake. And right at the last second, Gil comes out of nowhere to make the save. What a legend. But the attack was ineffective, leading Gil to get smacked into the water before Pan and Goku are thrown in. But once again, Gil saved the day, dragging both Pan and Goku into an unpolluted part of the lake. Using this moment of respite, a fully charged Goku and Pan take out the dragon, retrieving a fully restored orange Dragon Ball. Episode 3. Goku and Pan are in search of another Dragon Ball when they arrive in this town, eventually coming across some sort of slime which apparently has sucked up all the electricity. This has driven out the townsfolk and that's the premise of this episode. A small dragon then reveals himself to be the culprit and covers the two Saiyans in this electric slime. To the dragon's surprise, Goku and Pan get up relatively unharmed. In response to this, he begins gathering all of his slime growing in size. In response to that, Goku goes Super Saiyan 4 but still fails to stop him. The electric slime dragon gets yet stronger stronger again by sucking the energy from the power lines, growing bigger and taking a hold of Goku and Pan. He literally defeats both of them and right as he's about to deal the decisive blow, by pure chance, it starts to rain, resulting in him sort of short-circuiting and eventually losing his life. What an awful fight, what an awful ending, but at least they got the five-star ball and more importantly, this episode is over. Next. In this episode, we deal with yet another dragon. While closing in on another ball, the gang stumbles upon a village as it starts raining fi fish. The town worships this princess figure as she delivers fish to them, or something. Some kid has a bad relationship with his father and it's very sad and totally worth focusing on because I care deeply about it. Where the hell is the plot? Oh, here it is. Gil begins detecting the Dragon Ball coming towards them from across the bay. It is a girl, and I guess that explains the whole princess thing. Apparently this dragon was created using the Panties Wish in the very first arc of Dragon Ball. Much to her embarrassment, and so she attacks. For whatever reason, none of their attacks seem to touch her. However, it turns out that that is just a barrier she puts up as she is in fact a monster with a grotesque outer exterior. Goku begins spinning around, turning into the genie from Aladdin, I wish I was joking, and starts a battle once again, finding great success. But this is short-lived, and soon after is sent flying into a wall. But thanks to a seagull, yes I'm serious, Goku and Pan find the opening they needed to wrap up this episode's Dragon Ball. Thanks, I hate it. Next. In this episode, they face off against a ground dragon. One that digs. In case that wasn't clear. Okay, so this was getting to be a tired formula two episodes ago, but now it's honestly putting me to sleep. The dragon they're pursuing doesn't even want to fight, so they spend the entire first half of this episode just chasing him. However, it becomes clear that they need to stop him when he reaches a nearby town. Goku goes Super Saiyan 4 to save some civilians, and because Goku stopped the earthquake's destruction, which the mole dragon caused, they begin fighting. Apparently, he was born from the wish made at the World Martial Arts Tournament rectifying what Vegeta did. The fight finishes like you all know it well, Goku fights with it for a while, it makes a mistake, and then loses. One thing that's different this time, however, is that the Dragon Ball starts to absorb Pan. So, that's interesting. The dragon re-emerges, looking more intimidating, having absorbed the young Saiyan. Episode 6. So apparently he had been using this mole as a host before, and now he would be using Pan as the host, resulting in a more powerful dragon, I guess. Goku right now needs to defeat him without destroying Pan in the process, which honestly complicates things at the very least. The dragon knows that Goku won't fight back to prevent Pan, and so he begins destroying the city. Goku tries to put up a strong front, turning Super Saiyan, knocking him around. However, he soon catches on that Goku has been holding back intentionally. The dragon begins calling Goku's bluff and as he continues destroying the city, Pan from within the beast begs Goku to take him and her out together and eventually he does with a 10 times Kamehameha. But not really. Apparently Goku's heart wasn't in it and so the blast failed to take out the monster. How strong are these guys? Whatever. In a moment of ego and cockiness, the dragon shows Pan one last time to Goku, who seizes the moment by yanking her right out. Once Pan is freed, Goku goes 100% and destroys the dragon with relative ease, retrieving the Dragon Ball, bringing the episode finally to a close. Episode 7. 
Almost all of these episodes begin the exact same way, with Gil doing his job alerting the two of them to Dragon Balls that are nearby and Pan getting annoyed either shouting at him or attacking him for some unknown reason. Not only is this boring seeing the same joke land again and again and again, but it also doesn't endear me to Pan's character, who I really want to like. But back to the episode. The city that they've arrived in is super hot, so I'm guessing that's this one's theme. And yep, it sure is. The four-star dragon reveals himself and it's the first design that looks like it was taken somewhat seriously. Upon seeing the dragon, Pan makes a mad dash to take him out and with ease, the dragon knocks her out, but doesn't do anything further. He wants to have a regular battle with Goku, uninterrupted. As they fight, he reveals that he can momentarily raise his body temperature to the level of the sun, which is quite hot, I'm told. But so much of this early fight is spent with Goku running away from this guy, which seems really out of character for him. I mean, yeah, he's hot, but throw some key blasts at him or something. Maybe go out of base form? You have options, Goku. And eventually he does, making the last 10 minutes feel like utter filler. We then cut to Gil as he's tending to Pan when out of nowhere he's knocked to the side by some ice dragon. Finally, the plot is changing things up, which my sanity is grateful for. He looks the exact same as the four-star dragon, but blue. The fight that transpires between the four-star dragon and Goku is honestly pretty creative, utilizing their environment to change things up. The dragon fires his attack through a lens to magnify its intensity, and Goku has the great idea to use the Taioken or Solar Flare through that very lens, knocking him for a loop. Both fighters get up, and now it's time to take things seriously. The dragon sheds his skin to reveal a hotter exterior, and Goku goes Super Saiyan 4 to end the episode. Episode 8. You'd think that this episode would cover Super Saiyan 4's battle against the four-star dragon, but it doesn't. We cut instead to Vegeta, who wants to help but feels like he can't without the power of Super Saiyan 4, and thus begins an entire episode flashing back through Vegeta's story. Essentially, the plot of this episode is that Bulma has found a way to make Vegeta a Super Saiyan 4 using a machine, which on one hand, given Vegeta's story, is a nice change of pace for him. Consistently, Vegeta's fought against allowing himself to be loved and to love other people, focusing instead on his own strength and building that up. However, now those loved ones can help him become stronger than he ever could alone. That is a nice thing and I appreciate that, but a machine granting him that ability feels very at odds with what Dragon Ball's philosophy is and doesn't feel earned to me. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against helping him at all. I mean, the gravity chamber was a nice way for Bulma to help Vegeta to help himself, but this one just sort of feels like a free pass. As episode 9 then kicks off, so too does the fight between Goku and the dragon, who seems to have Goku beat in the speed department. But through the bizarre use of a mirror, Goku gets the jump on him. However, he gives him a second chance because he let Pan go. The fight therefore is reset, when suddenly out of nowhere, the ice dragon freezes Goku's arm. He begins berating his brother for being so foolish in battle, and as Goku dashes to Pan's side, the ice dragon freezes limb after limb of Goku until he can't move. The ice dragon then orders his brother to finish him off, but he ultimately refuses and unfreezes Goku, who now has his eyes set on taking out the cold dragon. Episode 10. In powering up, the ice dragon freezes the entire city. To prevent Goku from taking him out, he uses Pan as a hostage, throwing the child at Goku, who catches his granddaughter using his back to block the oncoming attack. That's a nice bit of choreography, I think, and actually works from a storytelling perspective too. But Goku gets the upper hand, eventually outclassing the cold-hearted ice dragon, getting him down to his knees. Begging for his life, he offers the ball to Goku in exchange before trying to catch Goku once again off guard. In falling for this underhanded trick, Goku's eyes take the brunt of the damage, resulting in him being blinded. Moving in for the final blow, the ice dragon dashes, only to be met with a fist through the chest by Goku, who reveals that he does not need to see to win. And win he most certainly does, receiving the three star ball. While still unable to see, Goku is handed a cure by the fire dragon, whom he has now befriended. As the two are about to go their separate ways, the four star dragon is shot down by a blast, revealing the final one star dragon, the main bad guy of this arc. In an effort to protect Goku once again, the four star dragon sacrifices himself. There's one dragon left and it's the most powerful one. And they begin to fight. But remember, Goku is still blind here. He never managed to use the potion the other dragon gave him and that potion has been destroyed since then. The fight is honestly quite entertaining with a lot of creative action set pieces being implemented at a fair. Within the chaos of the battle, Goku manages to land his strongest move on the one star dragon. Two, zero effect. Reacting to this, the dragon fires back with an attack of his own, leaving Goku hanging lifeless from a building scaffold. Episode 11. 
As he hangs from the building, Goku reverts back to his child form, defeated. As the One Star Dragon drops Goku from the building lifelessly to meet his doom, out of nowhere, Goten arrives to make the save with Oob, Gohan, and Trunks. Everyone's there to support Goku, including Videl, Chi Chi, and even Mr. Satan. The group begins instilling their power into Goku, but they are interrupted by the One Star Dragon that is now being called Shenron. The dragon targets Gohan first and then eyes up the rest of them, who all get saved by Goku at the last second using instant transmission. Despite it being a technique he can't use effectively as a kid. Convenient? But I digress. Oob manages to distract them long enough for Goku to absorb his friends and family's powers, resulting in a super-powered Super Saiyan 4. At this point, Goku can't be touched by Shenron despite being blind. After some action that includes throwing a clock around, Goku lands a 10 times Kamehameha on Shenron, and all is right with the world again it seems but Shenron has survived and begins absorbing the Dragon Balls one by one, gaining all of their powers. Episode 12. At this point, I want to make known that I hate this Shenron design with a burning passion. The battle rages on back and forth, Shenron demonstrating that he can use the other dragon's techniques. At this point, our hero Goku is pretty low, but he somehow, through the power of plot gets his eyesight back and lands a massive attack on Shenron, seemingly defeating him. But again, the dragon recovers using once again another one of the dragon's special techniques, healing his own body. Despite me being pretty certain that's not how that particular dragon's ability works. Also, I have no idea why he isn't using the first dragon's technique, you know, the one that sucked the energy out of everything? I mean, he'd be winning now if he was. But whatever. Some more back and forth continues and Goku finally gets him restrained looking to take him out the same way Vegeta did with Boo. But out of nowhere Vegeta interrupts this and using Bulma's machine begins transforming into an Uzaru and eventually Super Saiyan 4. But what really impresses me about this scene is exactly something I actually criticized in Dragon Ball Super. In Dragon Ball GT, Vegeta, not Goku, Vegeta is the one that brings forth the idea of fusion, and that shows a ton of character growth. Episode 13. The two Saiyans fuse, creating Super Saiyan 4, Gogeta. And Shenron cannot touch them. And Gogeta is toying with them in really unamusing ways, if I'm being perfectly honest. It gets very old very fast and really sucks the tension out of what was an episode that already lacked a lot of tension for me. Shenron gathers all the energy he can muster into one blast and Gogeta just kicks it away easily. And that's when, out of nowhere, suddenly the world becomes normal again. Apparently, when Gogeta kicked the ball, he converted the energy from negative to positive, which, okay. Gogeta then hits him with a Big Bang Kamehameha releasing all of the Dragon Balls, but for some reason this guy still refuses to kick the bucket. And wouldn't you know it, the fusion ends, despite it being only 10 minutes and the fusion expires because of power or something. Where have I seen that before? Episode 14. Okay, so Shenron won't let them fuse again and Goku eats the four star ball because Obviously. For a little while, there's a bit of a cat and mouse game going on here. Goku and Vegeta want to fuse, but Shenron isn't giving them the chance to. Why doesn't Goku just teleport somewhere safe with Vegeta to do it there? I, I don't know. Anyway, after 20 minutes of being thrown through buildings, they decide to use their after image technique and once again become Gogeta. Uh, but no, it didn't work because Goku was low of energy. They try once again, leading to Goku reverting back to base form. He is completely zapped of energy. Episode 15. Now with Goku as a kid and Vegeta in Super Saiyan 4, they need to figure out how to salvage this situation. And that's when they notice Goku has the four star ball on his forehead. The four star dragon then comes out of the ball and hits an oncoming blast away. The four star dragon claims to have been infected by Shenron when he absorbed him earlier and now fights Vegeta, whom he easily overpowers and is now down for the count. And after knocking Goku to the curb, it seems chances are grim. But when Vegeta rises to his feet, he comments that the four star dragon had been pulling his punches. That's when we notice that Shenron's guard is now down, leaving the perfect opportunity for the four-star dragon to dash in behind him and restrain him. The four-star dragon begins to glow, locking him inside some sort of heat ball. I don't know, what, what would you call it? Fireball, yeah, that's probably better. He self-destructs this fire heat ball, exploding the two of them, scarring the landscape beneath. The four-star dragon lands to the floor, seemingly victorious. And that's when Shenron emerges from his carcass like a spiky butterfly from a chrysalis. I have, okay, I caught for a second. I have no idea what's happening. This show is bonkers. So Shenron put himself inside the body of the soup, of the four-star dragon, and then he burst out again but he also exploded.
And that's when Vegeta drops back to base form too, because enough bad things haven't happened already yet, I guess. He turns to Bulma, who points out that the machine has been destroyed and therefore can't produce any more Blutz waves to, you know, power him up again. But little does she know that she can pull another one out of her butt super easy because she did that during the baby saga. Episode 60. There's really no tension for me at this point. Goku and Vegeta struggle against Shenron, who has now sidelined Vegeta and sent a blast towards the Earth. Goku now stands, holding back the blast in his base kid form, reaffirming to me that I have no idea how strong anyone in this show actually is. Goku manages to somehow deflect the blast, and at this point, I can't help but fret that characters like Goten, Trunks, and Pan have little to nothing to contribute to this final fight, barely getting any shine in the story at all, never mind from a dialogue perspective. Vegeta goes on to lament over his planet being destroyed by Frieza, and now this planet is about to follow the same path, ordering everyone to hop onto a spaceship with Bulma to survive, that that is the main priority. It's a pretty strong moment for Vegeta, charging headfirst into battle while ordering his children and Goku's children to someday avenge them. It's a really cool scenario, and to be perfectly honest, it would have been a pretty cool premise for a story too, but perhaps a little too dark for Dragon Ball. While Vegeta holds him off, Trunks and the rest of the kids decide to help anyway, which is a dumb decision and makes all of their lives useless now. Together they attack to no effect, and that's when Goku rises from the rubble with a spirit bomb. The first one of the series too, and... This is a pretty cool visual, possibly my favorite looking spirit bomb in the entire series. Not just GT, so how about that? Goku uses King Kai to communicate to the universe and gathers energy from throughout. He throws the bomb and the fight is over. Goku lies lifeless on the floor and the Dragon Balls release the original Green Dragon Shenron by themselves ending the episode. Which brings us to Dragon Ball GT's final ever episode, and man, it's a doozy. But like the other episodes, let's go through it slowly to figure out how it works. The episode opens as Shenron, unprovoked, heals Goku of his injuries and awakens him. Shenron begins explaining that due to their over-reliance on the balls, the Earth and the integrity of the Dragon Balls themselves have been compromised on more than one occasion, and so announces that he will be leaving. Goku quickly interjects and requests that the Earthlings that have fallen be brought back to life. Not that the Earth itself be fully restored to the way it was, just to bring back the Earthlings to life, explaining that they can all work together to restore the Earth themselves, which honestly, for me, was a really nice touch. Shenron agrees and the Earthlings are brought back. The group share a smile and celebrate the successful wish, but that is almost immediately brought to an abrupt stop as Shenron asks Goku to come along with him. Goku seems to know where he's going and says that he'll see everyone later. And as Goku flies off on the back of Shenron, he asks if he can stop at a few places before they leave for good. The first stop is Master Roshi's home, where he is reacquainted with the Hermit, Turtle, and his longtime pal, Krillin. They shoot the breeze and reminisce over their old training days when Krillin says this. Goku can see the hurt in Krillin when he says this, and with an unblinking smile, he asks if Krillin would like to spar for old time's sake, allowing Krillin to land one last punch, building up his confidence before leaving for good. A nice parting gift to his one-time rival and long-time best friend. The next and final stop Goku wanted to make was to see Piccolo, whom at this time is residing in Hell. It seems he's content working as effectively their security guard while there, which honestly is nice. Goku appears before him requesting to shake his hand, saying these parting words. <laughs> Piccolo, confused and distressed over what's been said, turns to find that Goku is once again gone. At this point, the episode switches back to the gang on Earth following Goku's departure. They all begin going their separate ways, but Trunks notices that Pan is still staring up at where Goku left. Trunks reassures her that the Dragon Balls will one day return and that they need to first help ensure that their strength is enough to protect the Earth and the universe on its own. As they leave, Pan notices Goku's clothes on the floor, picking them up. Vegeta, from outside of her point of view, tells her to hold on to that last piece of Goku dearly, as if to suggest that Goku was a very important person worthy of fondly remembering, even for Vegeta. With that, Goku falls asleep on the back of Shenron as the Dragon Balls disappear into the tired Saiyan's body. The scene fades to black as we cut to the next scene, the World Martial Arts Championships Junior Finals match in the distant future. A new spiffy young announcer begins introducing a fighter by the name of Son Goku. It's revealed that this young boy is a distant descendant of the Son Goku we're all familiar with, who, along with Mr. Satan, now has a statue commemorating him at the World Martial Arts Tournament grounds. Pan is seemingly at this point the last remaining character we all know alive, now a doting grandmother of the young Son Goku looking on from the sidelines as her grandson takes the stage wearing the same tattered clothes her grandpa left behind many, many years ago. 
As a cute turn of events, Goku Jr.'s opponent happens to be an ancestor of Vegeta, bearing a striking resemblance. The two begin clashing in dramatic fashion, assuming even Super Saiyan, when Pan notices something in the corner of her eye. <laughs> What follows this is honestly an intensely nostalgic look back at the journey we have all shared with Goku through the series as he walks out of the martial arts tournament grounds. The final lines of the story being, goofy, cheerful, and gentle, that's the Son Goku we all loved. This is where the story of Dragon Ball ends. What an outrageously appropriate, touching, and utterly beautiful way to close the book on what is to millions and millions of young people and old throughout the world their childhood, their inspiration, and even at times, their friend. And if this arc was simply just this episode, I'd have nothing but fantastic things to say. But let's talk about this arc as a whole before I end on a positive note. I really wanted to make this arc two separate videos as talking about the ending and the arc to me at least feel like two separate talking points. So let's take one before the other in this video. The arc as a whole had what is to me, and probably to most people who took the time to watch it, a very interesting and fitting premise for a story within the Dragon Ball mythos. There is absolutely an over-reliance on the Dragon Balls and to convince your audience that there are consequences for that over-reliance isn't a tough sell, but the execution of it felt incredibly formulaic at the best of times and incredibly boring at others for me. A worry that I had from the start was that with the premise as it was, an evil dragon emerging forth from each individual Dragon Ball, I feared that it would just turn into a monster of the week type format and it pretty much did, at least for a while. Five episodes covered the exact same formula. Show up in a town, Gil alerts them to a nearby Dragon Ball, Pan hits Gil for no reason, they find the dragon that's causing trouble to the city, village, or town, and they defeat it, and then the town is better. Five episodes in a row follow this very predictable, boring, tired format, and it really hurt the show for me. Additionally, with a premise and villains as easily justifiable as these, the dragons are given no motivation at all. They are just evil because. They have no reason to be evil, they just... Are. I don't really like that. They don't have an underlying motivation at all. They refer to themselves as evil, which to me just isn't interesting. The final villain for this story really felt lifeless for me. Like he had no personality and was a cookie cutter by the books Dragon Ball villain, simply there to facilitate big moments for the heroes to rise to, unlike characters like Vegeta and Frieza who improved the battles simply by being who they were. Additionally, his design really didn't do anything for me. I know this is a subjective thing, but it really just felt more Digimon than Dragon Ball, if that makes sense. And finally, Pan. I admire Dragon Ball GT for wanting to, and in many cases, successfully achieving a believable and interesting new character in Pan, but they never, and I mean never, give her anything worthwhile to do except cause problems for Goku and Trunks sometimes. In this arc, I ask, why is Pan still tagging along? Surely Gohan, her father who was eager to help, would have an issue with his daughter putting her life at risk like this. And not only that, she causes a problem for Goku in literally every single episode. Why is he cool with her being around all the time? Now, don't get me wrong, I love the idea of Pan as a character, but a character needs a reason to be present. And she really doesn't. She has a motivation to be there, sure, but not a reason or excuse to be there. But that brings us to the ending, which on its own is the single most fitting and tear-jerking ending I've ever seen. One that I've seen a great number of times prior to my watch through of this, but one that also never fails to bring a tear to my eye. Perfectly encapsulating what I love about Dragon Ball and Goku in a few simple snapshots at the end. It's a beautiful way to end the series and one I have never ever forgotten and probably never will. As always, I've been Totally Not Mark and thank you so much for watching. Until we meet again.